Hello everyone and welcome to the next episode of Coteries of New York. We are starting, as usual, by taking a little bit of rest to regain some energy. Wait, it doesn't actually work like that. And we are pretty hungry too, right? We'll have to feed because we got destroyed by Calican recently and we haven't mended all of our wounds. Too bad. Let's go then. Speaking of mending wounds, if you guys want to uh, see how it actually works in the pen and paper campaign, I uh, recommend you to check out the Vain Pursuit because we do have a plenty of damage that we're healing in there. But basically, aggravated damage, which I doubt we actually received. We received a superficial one. Aggravated one is uh, something that you have to heal over time. Um, it takes a while. It also takes free rouse checks per single damage mended, which means that uh, you will have to roll your dice three times and every single failure will mean your hunger going up once. This is interesting because with aggravated damage in my campaigns, what I uh, do as a character usually is knowing that someone received this aggravated damage and tries to heal it, I restrain them because there's a big possibility of frenzying um, if one feeds after that, because there's a possibility that your hunger is going to before or higher, which is creepy and yeah, shouldn't do that. But super, superficial is a little bit uh, easier to mend, it's not as difficult and uh, we should be able to mend it in the game as soon as we get a little victim for ourselves. So we just need a, a single rush check per um, damage mended. Waking up tonight feels different for two reasons. For one, you're pleasantly surprised that your body mended reasonably well while you were resting. There we go. It comes with a cavito. The hunger you feel is pronounced. The beast like a black dog on the edge of your vision, following you. Yeah, there are two ways to play this, I guess. One is um, this happening unconsciously when you sleep and your hunger rises, and the other is trying to consciously mend your wounds. Um, yeah, I guess you can do both styles <laughs> when you play role-playing. But what is truly remarkable is waking up to the tune of an old cell phone ringtone. An unknown number is calling the phone you get from Mia. You pick up. Get that old thing charged after all, huh? You alright? Um, no, actually, I feel like shit. Look, that's too bad, but I don't really care. I was just being polite. I'm coming with good news. Turk has agreed to meet you. There's a pub in the Bronx, Stories and Stripes. Be there tonight. Two things. No drinking on the premises, so if you want to grab a snack, do it before setting foot in the burrow. And this is an exclusively no powers meeting. We'll be rubbing shoulders with commoners the whole evening, and also we don't trust you. So keep it casual or you'll blow it. Anything you'd like to add? This. Yeah, I met Kalihan yesterday. He kicked my ass and forbid me from meeting Torque. I'm not sure if I should be there tonight. Silence in the line. Fuck. <laughs> Indeed. Fuck. More silence. I can't promise you any protection on your way there or back, but at the pub you'll be in Torg's domain. For all his posturing, Kalihan doesn't have the balls to strike Torg directly. We'll post additional lookouts on watch. That's the best I can do. If Kalihan got under your skin, I get it. I was in the spot once or twice too. All I've got to say, the risk is worth it. If you don't show tonight, I won't blame you, but it's a one-time offer only. You gotta hedge your bets. Just don't do anything stupid. You meet with us tonight, it better be in good faith. She ends the call. First things first, you take the subway to York Street Station, walk to Front Street, retrieve your car, and weigh your options while driving back to your haven. Hmm. Trust your intuition. I mean... Good to tap... Yeah, first, first things first, okay? You've been doing this for a good few nights. You're getting a feel for it. You're learning what kind of predator you are and what kinds of blood you crave. The predator type! So what kind of predator type are we? You're so caught up in yesterday's problems and in this cloak and dagger debacle, you're now part of that the hunt feels almost automatic and casual tonight. A fragment of your surrender is control. Just minutes after you find your victim, coax them and drink from them, you find you've forgotten their face and how they were dressed. 
that's probably a siren type of predator type, which is uh, you meet people and you uh, seduce them and then you drink with them from them, usually in the sexual situations or at the bar, kissing or something like that. Or maybe our Lafayette is a part of a scene, like for example, a scene of the artists or fashionistas of New York, which would mean that he's a scene queen, or I mean scene king probably, but it is called a scene queen in the book. It only hits you once you look at yourself in the car, car's rear view mirror. This was wrong. You can't let this become the norm. You hurt somebody. A human being. You're a monster. You need to stay mindful of this. You're a monster, but unless you let yourself off the hook, you can hold on to your humanity and not let yourself slide down the spiral. Instead of clearing your mind, this has clouded it further, and you are still no closer to a decision. Hmm. I mean, that will be the safest. We're doing it for her, and I guess she doesn't want to lose us, so I guess I would go to her first. Tell us if you can meet with Torque. It feels hopeless. Kalihan knows you'll be seeking Torque out. Somebody left that note at your apartment, so they know where you spend your days. It's all too risky. Sophie will have to come up with another plan, or just do it her own themselves. You stop at her haven, not looking forward to the conversation you're about to have. Sophie's not home when you arrive. You wait for her impatiently, all the while considering whether this is the best course of action. When she does come in a good hour after you arrived, she's all smiles and warmth. Lafayette, good evening. How is your task going? You have something for me, perhaps? Sophie, things got complicated. I don't want to meet with Tork. The warm atmosphere immediately grows colder, as does Sophie's demeanor. I thought I made a clear request of you. What do you mean you don't want to meet him? Listen, Kalihan's goons grabbed me yesterday and forced me to meet him. He was very clear that I cannot be seen talking to Tork or he'll have me killed. Oh. Something like pity appears in her eyes for just a moment. She looks at you, disappointed and sad. Then her features sharpen. I understand your concern. Nevertheless, I would ask you to continue, even if it's risky. The only way I'm doing this is if you offer me some protection. I do protect you, every night. My reputation in the city allowed me to save you from the prince's decree and continues to keep you safe. Is this how you repay me? You don't understand how much depends on you making contact with Torque and how important it is that I don't do it in person. It brings me no joy to remind you, but I still hold the right of distraction over you. If I have to call it on call on it to make you do my bidding, I will. I thought we had an understanding. I thought we were developing a partnership here. I did as well. I was under the impression you agreed to follow my requests. You were doing so well, too. Suddenly, Sophie's demeanor changes entirely. Although her features do not shift, she is now a source of fear for you. She is grim, determined, and seems utterly impossible to negotiate with. She uses don't! That's another uh, skill from presence discipline, which I also use a lot in the Vain Pursuit campaign. A lot! You will leave now and go back to the task at hand. You will not return until you have set up the meeting. Do I make myself clear? Wow, you really are heartless. Yes, Sophie. Good. And Lafayette, do it quickly. Time is running out. If it does, you will be of no more use to me. That final threat hits hard. You take your leave quickly, eager to get away from Sophie's terrifying presence. You relax a bit in the car, but are still certain that you must obey her. It's that or your life. Hmm. Drive around. You do intend to visit Tork tonight, but you decide to drive around a bit first. Something tells you there might be somebody tailing you. It's unsensible to try and lose them. You spend a good two hours looking in your rear view mirror and driving all over the city before finally driving to the Bronx. You take some basic precautions as you enter Torx turf. 
You park a few streets over from where the pub is and walk towards it while keeping an eye out for anyone suspicious. That kindred, for the most part, look no different than regular people, makes things complicated. They also are invisible sometimes. If you're being felt or watched, it's going to be hard to tell. You reach the pub, shoot a final glance around. There's nobody suspicious around as far as you can see. Exactly, as far as we can see. And open the door. The smell of cigarettes is overwhelming. The whole place has an aura about it. A constant fog hanging right under the ceiling. The lethargic fans do nothing to disperse it. The constant crack of billiard balls and clinking of glasses tells you all you need to know about the clientele. Not a very vampiric place at all. You're wondering if you got the address right. You apparently did. Mia is here. She motions you over to one of the few tables around. Took your sweet time to get here. What, well, cold feet? Never mind. Anyone follow you? Weren't you supposed to place lookouts to verify that? We did. Good word of you coming in a few minutes ago. I'm just checking if you paid attention. Before I introduce you, there's some outstanding business to discuss. You didn't prove very helpful at the bar. Carol, the bartender, mentioned that you made an effort, but as you can imagine, there's plenty of licks who use feminine pronouns in the city. Still, I'll take whatever I can get, so thanks for that, I guess. Come on, talk's right there. You walk throughout one of the tables. A guy in a coat and hat leans over to take his shot. He's way ahead of his opponent, the table's clear of his balls, save for the eight ball in a tricky position. Hey, they're here. Be with you in just a moment. The hit is fast, precise, and sends the black ball exactly where its player wanted it. His opponent lets out a frustrated sigh. That's that. I believe that's 150 American dollars, Julie. You wanna pay up now or wrap the stakes again? The scrantled man accepts his defeat and pays up, then declares he's going to grab another beer. The victor go the spoils. Thank you kindly. He turns his full attention to you. The man is good looking, if somewhat golden and tense. His eyes especially seem to pierce right through to the core, but not in an unpleasant way. Names, Torque. I believe you're Lafayette, Sophie Langley's new plaything. Is that right? <sighs> That's right. Yeah, Mia told me as much. Forgive me being real with you right off the bat, but I like to know what it is I'm dealing with. So here's something that I've been scratching my head about. If you're with Langley, and Langley's come through and through, I'm told, what it is you've come to accomplish here tonight? Sophie Langley wants to meet with you. Don't ask why, she didn't tell me. She just said it has something to do with gathering allies against Boss Callihan. I'm here to arrange that meeting. The fuck? I knew nothing about this, T. They lied to me. Mia's furious. She's looking at the pull cue and at you as if she was figuring out the best combination for the two. It's fine. I appreciate the honesty, even if you weren't straight with my second in command. That I don't appreciate. Well, well, well. Ain't that an interesting proposition? You can't be seriously thinking about meeting with Langley. She's hardline calm. It's a trap. It must be. It just might be. It just might. He looks at you, pierces you with his unnaturally keen eyes. He's about to say something when the door opens at the back of the room. Hey, Torque, um, you got a guest. They're in the back. Mia, won't you be a dear and keeper of new friend company? I'll see what the commotion is. Sure thing. Torque tips his hat to you and walks to the back, joining the man who called for him. Mia glowers at you, this time weighing one of the bull balls in her hand. She looks like she has a half of mind to chuck it at your face. You could be quite happy with yourself bluffing your way in here. I wish I did this differently, but it is what it is. I'm not proud of myself. You shouldn't be. You made me look like a chap in front of Torque. Here was I beginning to think you might make a good addition to your little family. There's a whole lot of trust you'll have to regain before that happens now. Torque appears from a door at the back and calls across the room. Yo, Mia! Can I grab you for a second? Lafayette, get over here too! You go to the back room. It's basically a storage area with a single wooden desk. 
It's pretty cramped, especially considering there are five other people in there with you. Turk ushers you in and closes the door behind you and Mia. Two burly dudes are holding somebody down. A familiar voice reaches your ears. Hi, it's Vince! Motherfuckers! It's gonna pay for this, you hear me? The boss is gonna fuck you up so bad, you have no idea! Have you had the doubtful pleasure of meeting Mr. Ceruti before, Lafayette? Ah, uh, I have a score to settle this fucker. You! You're fucked! You're so fucked you don't even know it, you stupid piece of shit! We should've ended you yesterday! The boss told you to stay away, you should've listened! That's a story in the half, ain't it? Vince, calm down now and tell me how many of your guys are still out there on my turf, hmm? Go fuck yourself, you're done! The boss will know the stupid piece of shit fledgling came here! He knows they're with Langley! You know what that means, Torque? Mm, no, I don't. What does it mean, Vince? Now the boss can wipe you out. You just say you're sucking Langley's tits and all those bodies of yours? Gone. You're done, Tork. Well, now. If that's the case, I guess ridding New York City of yours to, to toe the ass won't make things any worse, will it? Actually, there's an idea. Vince mentioned that he beat you up yesterday. Did I hear it right, Lafayette? You want to repay the favor? Gladly. Go right ahead. Stake Vince, hurt Vince a lot. I guess I'll just stake him. Yeah, there's an old pool cue in the room. <laughs> That's going to be fun. May I? Knock yourself out, kid. You break it over your knee. Fuck, you always want to do that. And approach Callihan's fuck with a sharp piece in your hand. Don't you fucking do it, Flangelig! Don't... You slam the improvised steak into his chest, hit the heart on the first try. Vince's features grow slack, his entire body inert. He doesn't even give out a yelp. And that's it. He's all yours. Take him downstairs. Let's keep Callihan guessing about what happened to his favorite puppy. I'll figure out what to do with this cum guzzler later. That's a little bit risky because he might get out of the basement. Eventually he might be freed by someone and then we'll be in trouble. The other two anarchs who held Vince down before take him out of the room. One of these anarchs is a betrayer. Betrayer, that's the name, I think so. And yeah, we're going to suffer for that, probably. As entertaining as it was, I think Vince, in his unmatched wisdom, shared more than Callihan would hope for. This changes things. Ever heard about Operation Lights Out, Lafayette? It was a Second Inquisition effort here in New York City. A single night of raids at the magnitude never seen before or since. The ivory tower got away with just a few losses here and there. No major players were hit. They managed to find safe spots and stay out of the eye of the shitstorm. Us, though, we got hit hard all over town. Havens were rooted out, entire coteries and safe houses gone just like that. Nobody saw it coming. I barely got out in one piece. Mia looks at him with concern and puts a hand on his arm. He shrugs it off, gently but surely. Others, like my child Barb or Mia Sire, extinguished. Or do you know who got out without a scratch? Callihan. We thought about it for the past few years. How was it that Big B managed to excuse himself from the State and Island Museum where we used to meet just before vans full of guys in body armor show up? How was it that as my baby is burning up after being shot with incendiary rounds, I also see Doc Callihan running with his tail between his legs, pushing fledglings like you in the path of the SI? We think the bastard knew what was coming and he set us up, not just us. Some of our brothers and sisters who got hit hard, some of the lowest profiles in the city's league population. The moral of the story? Callihan is an opportunistic motherfucker, and if even his thickest followers suggest he's going to sell me out, then that's what he's going to do, as sure as the sun rises. He pauses for a moment, and you see him reach a decision. You said something about Langley having an offer for me. It might be your fault, in part, that I'm at this juncture, but now's going to be as good a time as any to listen to what she has to say. I don't think it's wise, T. Mia, shut up. Well, what would you have me do then? You said it yourself. It's all this fledgling's fault. They brought this on us, so let's use them as a bargaining chip. Kalihan wants them, Langley needs them, they're valuable. 
you're wrong. I'm just a pawn. That's why Sophie sent me here. Plausible deniability and all that. I'm expendable. The realization that she just summarized the entirety of the last two weeks or so hits you hard. But if there was a moment to be honest with yourself, it is now. Fuck! The man puts his hand on Mia's shoulder. She calms down a bit. We're afraid, Lafayette. But then what else is new? It's a paradox, being who we are. The hunter one night, the hunted another. Masters of the night, slaves to the dawn. A duality to everything. Mia, I understand your concern, but I need you to trust me like you did before. This is my call and my responsibility. You can give me shit about it later like I'm sure you will. Count on it. He smiles, then takes a no-bullshit look and points at you. Three conditions. First, you come pick me up personally and bring me to the meeting spot. Anything goes sideways, it's your ass. Second, Mia's coming with me. No two ways about it. Eight eyeballs in the meeting, the two of you, the two of us, nobody else. And third, the meeting is in public, downtown, some spot frequented by mortals, we see you take us anywhere fishy, we check out and fuck you up as a message to Langley. I con on it not coming to that though, you seem likable enough. The cam hasn't gotten its talents in you yet, keep it up and maybe you'll come to the same conclusion with it in your own time. I'll make sure to repeat your conditions to Sophie. You do that. Best be on your way. Ask for me here when you need me. The bartender knows how to get in touch. Just ask him to put the owner on the line. Mia walks you to the door and accompanies you to your car. Listen, above what I said before... Save it. She freezes for a second, then shrugs her shoulders. Your call. See ya. She starts walking back to the bar as you start the engine and head back to Sophie's apartment. Time to give Sophie the news. The fear you felt when you left the apartment might not be there anymore, but the atmosphere is still frigid when Sophie addresses you upon entering. Tell me you have something for me. You know that she brightens up, just a little. More like sun rays glistening on frost and the radiance you know she's capable of. Well, let's hear it. What did Torque agree to? You relay the Anarx leader's conditions. You are to pick him and Mia up, the meeting should only include the four of you, and it should be held in the public space. Fine, I would ask that you pick them up tomorrow. How about Hudson Yards, the top of the vessel? Meet me there after midnight. I'll be waiting for you, but do try to be on time. I won't let you down. That's what I like to hear. She smiles. You feel momentarily blessed. I'm counting on you, Lafayette. The final puzzle piece is about to find its way to its destination. After that, we all get our just reward. You, me, the Camarilla, even the Anarx. After a fashion. Use the rest of this night well and take a good rest. We are but the day sleep away from shaking the city awake. Hmm, that sounds like something. Closer to the ending! Notes for Ailing Sturbridge. The final confrontation between Agathon and Juno is getting near. And a Ashlink, there we go. Ashlink Sturbridge, high regent of the Chantry of the Five Boroughs in New York, is impatient to see its results. You're in your haven when someone knocks on your front door. Puzzled, you open them. Agathon stands in the hallway expectantly, as if the 10 seconds it took you for you to come to the door was an impossible imposition. How did you know this was my apartment? Agatha looks impatient, as if he's explaining the simplest thing in the world. I drove you home last time, remember? That got me the neighborhood. As for the specific apartment, well, you left a pair in my car. <laughs> he did the illuminate the trail of prey, or the ritual, however it's called, to do that? Using that, your exact location was a matter of a simple application of the sympathetic principles. Shouldn't be so strange, everything we've done together has been about finding things through thaumaturgy. You follow Agathon down the street wondering what kind of revelations night will hold. He stalked me with my hair! Like, I just imagine him looking through his car for any traces of me because he missed me so much, he's the cutest. So far Agathon's rituals haven't been successful at locating the research notes, but you've learned a lot about the Tremere and Agathon himself. 
This time I've got it. The problem is, when an old vampire disappears, even from our clan, we're so secretive that it's hard for us to find out what they were up to. Agathon's car is parked at the curb. You get in and Agathon starts to drive. You may have guessed that the notes we're, we're looking for belong to... Oh, it's him, sorry. You may have guessed that the notes we're looking for belong to an old member of our house. The problem is that we need them to continue her research. Mm. Notes were left by someone in her clan who's now missing, right? Yes, her name wouldn't mean much to you, but Invidia Cole. For us, the only thing that matters is that she's not here anymore and we're left to pick up the pieces. You're getting used to sitting in Agathon's car in silence. He drives, you look out of the window, back to Queens. Eventually, you roll up to an industrial area called Willets Point. Doesn't really look like a place where a blood sorcerer would hang out. Agathon parks in front of a car repair shop that looks like it has some better days. There are huge puddles of water on the road and car wrecks strewn about. Better be quick. If I can find this place, so can you know. You look around to see if someone is observing you, but there don't seem to be any people about. And why would there be? Who would hang around in a place like this at night? Bad people! Agathon tries the front door of the repair shop, then circles around to the back. You follow him. There's a broken window in the back protected by iron bars. Agathon grabs them and gives them a quick shake. The entire iron grill comes off. Startled, Agathon lowers it to the ground. I suppose someone else has already broken in and didn't want to leave an obvious point of entry. You and Agathon clamp inside through the window. It's awkward, but not difficult. Looking around, you realize that the repair shop has been abandoned for some time. It looks like homeless people have stayed here in the past, but nobody's currently squatting on the premises. You try a light switch, but nothing happens. You know the drill? I'll do the ritual in the office, make sure there are no interruptions. Agavon makes his way to the repair shop's office, a slightly cleaner area than the rest of the building. He begins the ritual in the dark. Hmm. This time I would shift through the papers. Bored, you start shifting through the papers left on the office's desk. Old shift records, invoices, ads, nothing from the last decade. There's a small TV on the desk, probably from the 90s. Looking closer, you realize there's a post-it note on the middle, in the middle of the TV screen, I guess. You take it. It reads, loser, Juno, oopsie. Agavon stops gesturing. They're not here. How is that possible? You show him the post-it note. He takes it and looks it over, as if suspecting it might hide a devious trick. Fuck, she has the notes, and she had to gloat. We have to go. It feels like you've spent a lot of time recently hurrying after Agathon as he walks briskly in and out of buildings and to his car. <laughs> That's a nice way to spend your time. He starts the car as you close the door. We have to go to her haven and get the notes. There's no time to waste. Despite the urgency of his words, Agathon drives as carefully as ever. It seems that only a threat to his grandmother is enough to make him drive recklessly. What do we do with her? Is she an enemy? Well, let's not be hasty. I'm sure we can talk this through. Agavon doesn't sound too convinced. Juno's haven is in Brooklyn, in a waterfront warehouse. The thing is, vampires are not very keen on other vampires telling strangers about their haven's location so i think juno will be very reasonably mad at agafon for bringing me around agafon drives to south brooklyn this is one of the advantages of being undead moving at night traffic is much lighter than if you wanted to zoom around the five boroughs during rush hour parking the car agafon points to a light coming from an otherwise dark yellow brick warehouse that's her. Let's go in. Um, no time to get fancy. You got the front door of the warehouse. We just want to talk, so I'm not going to go behind. The door has glass panes, uh, so you can see the inside of the warehouse. There are candles and an ornate ring of occult symbols covering the entire floor. Juno is sitting in the middle with an animal wash basin in front of her and is peering into it. You try to listen, but it's difficult without making yourself conspicuous at the pain. We have to talk to her. 
Agathon tries to break down the door by ramming into it with his shoulder. It's flimsy and breaks with surprisingly little effort. Agathon, just in time. Juno, you have to stop. Hand me the notes. Oh, Agathon, you're such an idiot. This is beyond you now. I'll give you one last chance. Come with me. Forget Ashling and her power games. Join me and you can become your own man. What? Agathon seems genuinely flabbergasted at the suggestion. Who's your contact, Juno? Who are you talking to? Juno smiles at you. That's a good question. I guess Ashling Sturbridge doesn't go around trumpeting the fact that the old hierarchy doesn't hold a monopoly on Tremere power anymore. <gasps> V5 lore! Let's go! There are other viruses out there, and I will join them. Juno picks up a bulging old folder from a chair inside the ritual circle. If this Dambus has any brains, he'll join me. No, and not for the clan, but for my family. My real family. Juno sighs. She doesn't look surprised at Agathon's, Agathon's refusal to come with her. I would have felt badly if I hadn't offered you the chance. Come back to the Chantry with me, Juno. Talk to Ashling. You'll see that this is not a good idea. You glance at Agathon with concern. You're no sorcerer, but the idea of fighting Juno in the middle of her ritual circle doesn't seem like a good idea. Two words. Fuck you. Celerity? She's in a circle. Presence. Please, just give us the notes. We won't stop you from leaving. Juno's shoulders slump. I'm tired of the fight. I'm tired of having to bust my ass for some asshole like Ashling. I want a new life away from all the scrap. Juno weighs the folder in her hands. Maybe I should just give this to you. She walks towards you and you put your hand on the folder, but then... Juno's eyes brighten with realization. You fucker, you manipulating me! She slaps your face and you feel as if your insides have suddenly caught fire. <gasps> you open your mouth but no sound comes out. Finally, you focus on the feeling of Agathon's hand on your shoulder and you realize you lie sprawled on the floor. Are you alright? Can you speak? The pain is receding, but you feel like shit, hurting all over and barely able to walk. It'll take a lot of blood to mend from the states. Agathon supports you as you walk back. He's smiling. He notices the folder under his arm. She got away, but I have the notes. I'm sorry you got hurt, but it was worth it. Yay! Worth it. You tell him a thing or two about your view of the situation, but your tongue is momentarily a lump of charcoal in your mouth. Speaking of the fire, I feel like this game actually came out uh, before the Clothes of the Blood Gods was released, but it's very fitting because in Clothes of the Blood Gods, the Cainite Heresy, the Church of Cain actually has the blood sorcery rituals that cause uh, the blood in someone else to burn. It literally like burns inside, causing extreme pain. So that would be kind of useful in here and, you know, just to combine these two lores. But anyway, uh, yeah, what she told about the <coughs> the whole breaking of uh, Tremere Pyramid, it's true. Uh, the f uh, Chantry of Vienna has fallen, and this is, by the way, not the public information in the World of Darkness. We know that, as people who read the V5 core book, we know that the Tremere Chantry has fallen, but uh, it is not something that all the uh, cities in the US, for example, no. Um, I think, think it's also going to be explored in, um, in Vampire the Masquerade Bloodlines 2 with the newcomers faction. We'll see about that, but I have my suspicions about this. So, um, what happened is after the pyramid bro broke, before that, Tremures were tied to each other with the blood bonds and there was a very strict hierarchy in the clan. The chantries, um, the regions on top of the chantries and then um, the, the lower levels of uh, vampires, all of them being uh, having some kind of a boss instead of a faction. And it was very much of uh, Agathon, for example, is doing everything from Ashling Sturbridge and he cannot say no because he would be blood bonded to her. So that's, that's how it worked. But after the, um, the Vienna's Chantry of Tremere fell, apparently the blood bond suddenly disappeared. 
and the whole structure collapsed and this separated House Tremere or Clan Tremere into three houses. House Karna, House Goratrix and House Tremere. And in this particular case, um, Agathon seems to be a part of the House Tremere or at least, you know, the old school Tremere that still operates like the Chantry is existing. And uh, I would actually assume that Juno is acting with her whole uh, hatred towards the masquerade that she showed earlier. She's behaving like a part of the house Goratrix. And uh, if you want to know more about that, watch my Tremere video because I talk about the full lore in there. I sit in silence as Agathon drives you back to Manhattan. Traffic in the small hours is mercifully slight. You consider your next words. What will happen to Juno now? Is your clan really going to let her go? Maybe, I don't really know. We have the notes and that's what counts. Agathon sounds almost as if you wanted Juno to escape. Perhaps it really was about the research for him. You reach the cold box door. After Agathon parks the car, you head inside. You climb to the second floor to find Ashling Sturbridge waiting for you. She looks surprisingly casual for someone with such power. You have good news, I hope. Yes, we have the notes. Agathon hands over the folder. Ashling Sturbridge caresses the cover with obvious joy. Wonderful. You did not disappoint. What of Juno? We're not able to stop her. She escaped. Well, no matter. Agathon, you prove yourself yet again. And Lafayette? Looks like the pyramid has a good friend in you. Aww. The traditional hierarchy of blood bonds reaching from top to the bottom of the pyramid used to define the Tremere, but after the fall of Vienna, their blood has recoiled and aborted all such connections. There we go, I said that. As such, it can no longer blood bond other kindred. Without the rigid structure ordering their clan into rank and value, some warlocks find themselves competing for anything that might allow them to regain some of their former power or actually independence. That is totally true. Um... Accept the compliment in silence. He nods, not saying anything. Agathon looks relieved. You leave the bookstore with praise ringing in your ears. Even the tacky, tacky turn, tacky turn? Is that how you say taciturn? Agathon manages a smile. You have no idea what will happen with the notes. Hey, I got the achievement. Burn after reading. What happened with the notes, but you feel that you have reached an understanding with Agathon. Perhaps it's enough in this world of backstabbing and betrayal that you now inhabit. Does that mean that I already have two people in my coterie? Because that's cute. Rest up. You wake up. And that's when we will end it for today, guys. Thank you so much for watching this episode of Coteries of New York. I feel like we're slowly going towards the end. So we seem to have to cutry members, Hope and Agathon, which I'm very happy of. I feel like they're okay. And um, yeah, and Hope is also post diablery so I guess she's she's stronger. Um, yeah, whatever is awaiting us, I'm feeling positive about this. We'll see how this will go. Thank you so much for joining me and don't get lost in the night. See you in another one.